Thank you, Dr. Hunt. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. First, I wish to express my thanks to the Cultural Knowledge Consortium for inviting me um, to present this lecture today. And second, I wish to thank you, the audience, for your interest in attending, and I look forward to your participation. My talk will be on the culture of Afghanistan. There are many cultures in Afghanistan, but they share three common components, tribal code, Islam, and impact of geography. The last, geography, has defined the people. Afghanistan is roughly the size of Texas in terms of its mountainous terrain and steppe climate of hot summers, cold winters, it can be compared to Wyoming. Afghanistan is divided by the Hindu Kush mountains. These mountains first divide the country in half diagonally and then divide it again into two concentric circles. First, the Hindu Kush runs northeast dividing the country into three major regions. First is the Central Highlands, part of the Himalayas, and account for roughly two-thirds of the country's area. The southwestern plateau accounts for another quarter of the land mass, and the third, the smaller northern plains, contains the country's most fertile soil. Second, the Central Highlands formed by the Hindu Kush expands outward, east to west, in a vast, almost circular mountainous plateau with peaks rising between 12,000 and 19,000 feet in height. There's a little humanitation here. <coughs> Excuse me. Historically, it has served as a sanctuary for the ethnic Hazaras. Most Afghans live in settlements, cities, towns, villages that encircle the plateau. So here we have a topographical physical map of uh, Afghanistan. You can see the Hindu Kush first divides north, east, south, west, then the expansion in the central highlands, the northern area being the uh, fertile area of the country, and the south and the southwest being the desert. And the human habitation will be confined around this central plateau. To give you an idea, here's a view of the Hindu Kush among the world's highest mountaintops. Here is a view of the Hindu Kush from the valley <coughs> in the city of the capital city of Kabul, lying in that valley. Like the central highlands, the south and west of the country is also sparsely populated. The area is part of the Registan Desert. And Registan uh, is a Persian word meaning land of sand. And this is a sand <clears throat> that is very different from what most people are familiar with in the West. It is almost as fine as talcum. So here's an example of a motorized vehicle sinking into the sand. Uh, the talcum is so fine, it gets into the motors, gets in the gas tank gets into the goggles even if you put uh, extra protection by taking, say, wet cloth and inserting it around the goggles to try to give an uh, uh, adhesive quality. So there's very few uh, habitation there. But in this region, it is noted for what's called the wind of 120 days. It's a northerly wind that blows across the western and southern regions of Afghanistan during the months of June through September. The wind is accompanied by intense heat, drought, and sandstorms. Dust and whirlwinds occur during the summer months in the flat and southern parts that we're just looking at. And the storms rise in the early afternoon and could achieve a velocity of between 60 and 110 miles an hour. So an example. Here is a dust storm, sandstorm. Looks like from here the uh, size of a mountain as it's approaching the military base in uh, southern Afghanistan. Now this is an aerial view from satellites by NASA, Aqua, and Terra showing you the full extent that some of these uh, sandstorms uh, can achieve. This is the border of Afghanistan with Pakistan. 
Here's Afghanistan, here's Pakistan, and the whole southern area engulfing Helmand and Kandahar province is experienced a uh, sandstorm, a fundamental uh, phenomenal rather uh, size. This is the Afghanistan's fertile uh, northern plain. Afghanistan, as you can see, has is vulnerable to drought because it only has four principal rivers. You have in the north the Amadaria, in the uh, west you have the Harirud, and in the southwest you have the Helmud. In the east there is the um, Kabul River. Now, only 12% of all of Afghanistan is irritable. And that area is dependent on winter snows and spring rains for the water. But it employs 79% of the labor force. Now, what is the impact of geography on the uh, Afghan cultures? It first, and most importantly, from which all things uh, flow, it prevented emergence of a large landowning class, as exists in Pakistan, India, and Iran. At least 80% of the people live in villages that are self-sufficient communities, dependent on subsistent level agriculture and pastoralism. And villages run their own affairs with little outside interference, functioning as virtually independent city-states, jealous of their freedom and their separateness. This fosters egalitarianism, group solidarity, and the need for group consensus. Now these villages, here's a picture of a layout of an Afghan village. It is built for protection. So you have the walls, and sometimes the enclosures can be so large that within a given compound, you can have a mosque, you can have stables, you can have uh, a small orchard. But how do the uh, villages come about? Uh, historically, villages are established by organic growth. They get their start when people, usually relatives, bought or given land when, where they built their houses. Over time, these grow in size, but as individuals who started, there is no decision by a village per se to split because it's become too large. In mountainous regions where resources are limited, people may migrate out, often to the cities if there is no room for expansion or there are not enough resources to support a family. A slightly different case arise in the Kala communities, where all the households are part of a large single uh, structure. And that is divided uh, over time, when it becomes too large and there is a ecological footprint, the ability to maintain the agriculture to the optimal size of the population. When it reaches that, then there will be a split. Now, the culture of Afghanistan is united and divided by four elements, language, religion, ethnicity, and race. First, the culture of Afghanistan has an extensive Persian or Iranian influence. Uh, half the country speaks Persian. Well, in Afghanistan, that Persian is called Dari. As you can see on this slide, uh, estimated um, 50% of the population speaks Dari. Now Pushtun is related. It's part of the Iranic family of languages. Uh, that's 35%. But they are not mutually uh, understood. Now within Afghanistan, you have minority languages. Uzbek and Turkmen, 11%, and 30 other minority languages. And we'll address some of the minority groups later. Uh, total, uh, 4%. With regard to the Dari, the Persian, it's not just the ethnic Tajiks, who are ethnic Persians, but are Sunni, not Shia. It is also the language of the Hazaras, and the Imex, and the Kizilbash. So this is a color depiction of the Indo-Iranian languages. As you can see, the light green is, and we'll just touch on the, the larger groups. The light green are the Kurds. The yellow is the Persian. As you can see, it continues into Afghanistan, Tajikistan. Uh, the Pashtun is related. 
in pink, and the Baluch is also related as a language family. It is similar to Romance languages or Slavic languages. So in Romance, you have French, Italian, Catalan, Castilian, um, but they're all part of the same root family. And this is the same here uh, with these other languages all coming from the same uh, family source. Now, in this picture, you can get a better uh, indication. The light green is primarily the language spoken is Dari or Persian, and the brown is the Pushtuns. What we'll see later is in this area, say 12 and 7, are Pushtun areas, and 12 has the most important historic city of Herat. They're Pushtuns, but they're bilingual, and they can uh, officially function uh, with the Dari language. The gray here is the Baluch, the orange, 8 and 13, are the uh, Turkmen and the Uzbeks. These two here we'll talk about later. They're very small and unique peoples, the Pashai and the Rastani. Now, the uh, importance of Islam in Afghanistan, you have both the Sunni and the Shia, and this map gives you an idea of where in Afghanistan, you, in relation to the rest of Central Asia and the Middle East, uh, of the Shia population. So here's the Shia in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and you can see the central portion of Afghanistan being uh, Shia. Now, the culture of Afghanistan has been shaped by Islam. Uh, most Afghans, 80% are Sunni. They belong to the Hanafi Law School, one of the largest and most tolerant of the four schools of jurisprudence in, is, uh, in Sunni Islam. It permits prayers in languages other than Arabic and continuation of some pre-Islamic customs. 19% of the Afghans are Shia, as we said, and they uh, belong to the same branch of Shiism called the Twelver School, as exists here in Iran, Iraq, and eastern Saudi Arabia. Now, here's just a pie chart. It's overwhelmingly a Sunni country, but there is that importance uh, Shia population. And the Shia is going to be overwhelmingly, as we'll get to in a moment, uh, the Hazara ethnic community. The confining of the Shia to the Central Highlands corresponds to the fact that this is the homeland, the Central Highlands, a uh, homeland of the Hazara ethnic group. Now, the third element uh, uniting and dividing Afghanistan is ethnicity. There are three groups that account for nearly 80%, 85% of the population. Pushtuns are approximately 40%, Tajiks are approximately 25 and the Hazaras are, are, are 18%, excuse me. There are two major uh, physical types in Afghanistan, two racial groups, the majority, 72%, are Iranian, uh, Eastern Mediterranean in appearance. So they are Pashtuns, Tajiks, and Baluch. Uh, Mongolian in appearance, Asian characteristics, would be the Hazaras, the Uzbeks, and the Turkmen. Now this is just a picture, uh, next couple of slides, of what the people actually uh, look like. Here are their characteristics, Pushtuns. Here are the characteristics, Tajiks. And here are the Hazaras. Now the Hazaras, like the Uzbeks and Turkmen, as I mentioned, have Mongolian features, but they are Shia. And they have experienced racial discrimination and religious persecution historically. Many Hazaras were slaves until the final emancipation laws that only took place in the 1920s. In, their, in addition to their declared objective of destroying the idols, the Taliban destruction of the Buddha statues at Bamiyan was also an attack on Hazara cultural identity. For the Hazaras, who are devout Muslims, the Buddha statues were not idolatry, they were part of their history, separate from uh, any religious connotations part of their patrimony. 
So they viewed it uh, as a deliberate attack by the Taliban um, to erase part of, of their identity within Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan, there are also several groups that are not based on ethnicity. Their names are umbrella terms. So one is the IMEC. It's a Mongolian term meaning tribe. Uh, they constitute four separate nomadic groups. One is the Mon uh, Mongol group, which is uh, the Timuri, and then three Iranian groups, the Temanis, the Ferrokohis, and the Jamshadis. Now, the Amex are uh, Sunni, and oftentimes uh, is, uh, they are counted along with the Tajiks as one group. Uh, and they prefer it that way. They do not want to be mistaken for the Hazaras, because even the Hazaras, despite the laws, are still not accepted. They're still looked down socially by many tribes. And the Amics don't want any mistake for being considered Hazaras because of, of some of their appearances. And they, if they have to identify, they identify with Tajik. The Kuchi is a word that you might have uh, heard. Uh, it's a Persian word meaning migration. It again refers to nomads. These were used uh, during the wars, uh, the Soviet wars and then the uh, Taliban wars, because as nomads, they were a great source of intelligence, moving around, getting close to encampments, getting close to uh, cities, and being able to uh, provide intelligence to whoever their sponsor was. The Kuchis the Kuchi could be both uh, Pushtuns or Baluch. And the saying is, uh, all, uh, not all uh, Kuchis, um, let's see, not all Kuchis are Baluch, but all Baluch are Kuchis. So the Baluch is overwhelmingly a, a nomadic uh, community, but there is that small minority within the Pushtuns that are not settled and are also nomads that fall into Kuchi uh, label. The Nuristani, again, it's an umbrella term. It is a designation for 35 separate groups. Uh, they speak six languages, none of which is in a written form. Uh, they number about 100,000 to 150,000. They're in the uh, far uh, northeast of the country. There are different theories uh, that have been proposed as to their origins, including that they are the original inhabitants of this land predating the arrival of the Pushtuns, or that they are the descendants of the army of Alexander the Great. Physically, uh, these Afghans resemble Europeans standing apart from most other uh, Afghans by having often uh, blonde or red hair, blue or green eyes, and fair skin. So here's a picture of the uh, Nurasanis. Uh, they were the first to uh, fight the Soviets in Soviet uh, invasion and occupation. Even historically, they have, uh, uh, before that, a, a reputation of uh, fierce warriors. Now, Afghanistan is a non-European tribal society and the concept of nationalism, which you often hear applied in various forms uh, to the Afghan situation currently, uh, has limited applicability. Uh, nationalism that we're talking about is time and place specific to 19th century Western Europe and the beginnings of industrialization. Now, the Western concept, this nationalism, has two traditional models, uh, France and Germany and uh, they are not applicable to Afghanistan. Let's go. In the French model, uh, the Revolutionary War 1789, the revolution and subsequent Revolutionary Wars, uh, the French within the country, which was the north part of the country, uh, sought to integrate, assimilate French, uh, Francophone, Francophone rather, uh, all the other uh, groups in the country. These include Bretons and Basques, Dutch, Germans, Italians, and the entire South is Occitan. This process, homogenization, if you will, ethnic homogenization, uh, led by the French at that time, is inapplicable uh, to Afghanistan. As you can see, it's a loose coalition 
of these various ethnic groups uh, that any attempt to force one's identity, culture, standards, norms onto another uh, tribal community is going to result in uh, volatility, instability. So the French model doesn't work. Often you hear propose the German model. Uh, the German model was you had a German nation that was divided among several uh, independent states. So you would unite all those states into one state and, and thereby unite all the Germans in that one state. Well here you have the Pashtuns divided uh, by the Duran line between Afghanistan where they're 40 percent of the population and their sizable population in Afghanistan in the North uh, West Frontier Province region. You also have over the borders uh, Turkmen and Uzbeks and especially outside of the Pushtun, the largest group uh, with a large co-ethnic group outside is um, the Tajiks. Interestingly there has not been any serious movement of secession of Turkmen wanting to leave Afghanistan and unite with Turkmenistan. Uzbeks, no serious movement there wanting to leave Afghanistan and become part of Uzbekistan, nor among the Tajiks. Now in the issue of the Pashtuns, uh, what is different here is that it is considered a decolonization issue. Um, the unification of the Pashtuns in Pakistan with uh, Afghanistan is yes by the Pashtuns considered as part of a, a national uh, regrouping unification uh, but it is also seen by the Afghans whether Pashtuns, Tajiks, Turkmen, Hazaras as part of uh, the ending of decolonization struggle because the country functions as a loose coalition, uh, increasing the size, including the numeric size of Pushtuns, pose no threat to these other regions, theoretically and historically, uh, because they're self-sufficient and function virtually independently of the others. There is a pride in being Afghan, whether it's Tajiks or Turkmen or Hazaras, because they are one of just two Sunni states the other, the Ottoman Empire, that successfully resisted European colonization and preserved their independence while Muslim states in Africa, Central Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia lost theirs. And this history is very important for the identity. Now, when we look at Afghanistan and this functioning of different ethnic communities, their cultures are different, but there is a similarity, as I said, with the codes and with the impact of Islam and with the impact of geography, making group consensus and cohesion so important. There is uh, one other parallel uh, outside of Afghanistan for this type of situation of a loose coalition of ethnic groups functioning. Oh, here's just an example accentuating Here's the Ottoman Empire, here's Iran, Shia, and here's uh, the second uh, Sunni state, which uh, these three being independent, while well, you can see India, Indonesia, and Africa, and then to the north, Central Asia had fallen to European uh, imperial rule. Afghanistan, however, in its uh, format has one comparison that could be made, a qualified comparison and that is to Switzerland. For Switzerland too is a political union of different linguistic communities, in this case German, French, Italian, and Romanche. These communities are also uh, divided into two denominations of one religion, Catholic and Protestant Christianity. Their identities and cultures are preserved and protected by the mountainous terrain, and none of them seek unification with their co-ethnics in Germany, France, or Italy. So here's uh, the breakdown in Switzerland and the purple is, is a, a small community, a, a Latin language derivative community called the Romanche. 
the only movement of separation occurred in Jura uh, during the 70s. Uh, it was a French-speaking can uh, canton that, wanted, that was part of a, of a German canton. And they were uh, waging a demand uh, for uh, secession, but not secession from Switzerland. They had no intention or desire to join France. It was completely alien to their culture and their way of life. All they wanted was their separate canton in, uh, in Switzerland. So that's what uh, uh, the closest, uh, closest but qualified comparison uh, that you have. This is just a map that if Switzerland was divided among uh, the linguistic parts, how it would look. Most of it, of course, would be with German because it's 60, 65% German. But again, like Afghanistan, no one has the wish to join their co-ethnics uh, in neighboring states. Now, the central role of culture in Afghanistan begins with the establishment of the independence of the country in 1747. Uh, at a time when most countries emphasized, in this region, in the Muslim world, emphasized Islam um, as preeminent uh, foundation uh, for their government. When Afghanistan was created, it was created by Pashtuns, and the primary legitimacy was based on two, based on tribal genealogy and tribal culture, the, the code of Pashtun Wali. Now, while Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks, Turkmen, have retained uh, a tribal code. They have not retained a tribal identity. Many use the name of their ethnic group or their village or their region to identify themselves. The Pushtuns, however, have retained a strong sense of tribal identity. And there are three reasons for the importance of tribal identity, both historically and currently. The, the first is religious. In uh, chapter 49, verse 13 of the Quran, it says, Men, we have created you from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you might get to know one another. The second justification is social. Belonging to a tribe means uh, being of a distinguished ancestry, an ancient ancestry, going to a general people, having an identity and a place and a history. It offers a network of obligations, but it also provides a network uh, of protection. And the third justification of tribal identity, just on the individual basis, is uh, survival through this group membership. Now, in Afghanistan, the uh, importance of Pushtun belief of belonging to one huge kinship group uh, provides its members with uh, the four things that I think are important, I just want to repeat. Uh, protection, history, status, and place. Now, the Pushtuns themselves are divided into two tribal confederations, the Durrani, which is in western Afghanistan, and the Gilzai, which is in eastern Afghanistan. Now on this map, the light blue, going from Herat, Kandahar, Kabul, are the Pushtuns. I just want you to see that to get an idea of Pushtuns in general, where they live. In the next slide, we'll break it down between the Durrani and the Gilzai confederations. Now, the light green in the east, uh, in the west, excuse me, is the um, Durrani confederation, and the yellow is the Gilzai confederation. Now, these two tribal confederations are in turn divided into four principal tribal groups. These are the Sarbans. Batan, Gargash, and Karlans. These names are derived of the tribes, are derived from the names of the four sons of the uh, mythical founder of Pushtuns called K. Abdur Rashid. 
the Pushtuns believe that they are one of the lost tribes of Israel and that their founder, K. Abdur Rashid, was the 27th descendant of uh, King Saul. Now this next slide is a diagram of these Pushtun tribes with their affiliate clans which appeared in the May-June 2008 issue of Military View Command and General Staff College. They're neat, uh, they're neat and clean but they have to take in consideration that the Pushtuns are practical so there are exceptions uh, to this chart. The uh, tribal character is based on patrilineity, but in some cases this principle is set aside uh, for notable exceptions. And some of the notable exceptions uh, are the tribes as the Afridi and the Gilzai. They are connected by Pushtuns by female links. Uh, in principle, one has to be born into a tribe, but Afghan pragmatism allows exceptions. Uh, once again, uh, powerful tribes as the Afridi and the Gilzai are connected to Pushtuns also by the fellow Pushtuns also by adoption. Through consensus of a tribe, outsiders may be allowed to take residence in the tribal homeland. If such outsiders and their offspring honor the tribal code of behavior and succeed to intermarry with the tribe, they may be accepted as full members after a generation or two. Thus, whereas in some countries tribes are structured like trees, in Afghanistan uh, tribes are more like jellyfish. Therefore, the system of government is seldom found in full force. That uh, diagram uh, from the uh, Command and General Staff College, uh, it must be considered as a model for the tribal structure. And not, a correct uh, and not a correct description of each and every tribe. All it's important is to know what they believe, how they are connected, and that there are some exceptions. Um, there are some issues causing confusion, and that is the, the words and the use of the words, uh, two in particular, Qam and Kel. Now, the word Qam can mean people, ethnic group, or tribe. So in a conversation, Qam can be referring to the Afghan people, or it can be talking to the Pushtun ethnic group, or it can be talking about the Gilzai Confederation. It depends upon the context of the speaker. Uh, a sub-tribe or a clan is called a Kel. It gets a little confusing because any tribal unit can be seen both as a tribe or a sub-tribe at the same time. And so you would have a group called a Qam or called a Kel simultaneously. Again, it's the context and the familiarity uh, with the tribe that can help uh, to clarify the issue. Uh, a tribe or a sub-clan of a Kel, a sub-unit of a Kel is also called a Kel. Uh, and that goes down to the village levels. On a rare occasion, some Kells have become uh, tribes in their own right, have been elevated to that status, uh, such as the Suleiman Kell. These are just exceptions, as there are in any rules. Um, they're just made to uh, need to clarify a situation that the, the paradigm, the, the template of how the tribal structure exists is legitimate, but it does have these qualifications. And some confusion can be minimized by realizing how the context of the word qualm and kel within the culture is uh, used. Now, tribal culture functions according to the Pushtun Wali and the Nark. Now, the Pushtun Wali uh, is the foundation of Pushtun culture and may be translated as the way of the Pushtuns. It is an oral code that dates back to pre-Islamic times, but its practices do not contravene the principles of Islam. The main tenets of Pushtun Wali are, and it's like common law, it keeps on growing, uh, Milmastia, which is hospitality, Nanawatai, which is asylum, Badal, justice, Tura, bravery, Sabat, loyalty, 
Imandari, righteousness. Istikamat, trust in God. Bairat, courage. Namus, protection of women. Nang, honor. An example of Pushtunwali is the 2005 case of Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell of operations Red Wings. He was part of a four-man surveillance and reconnaissance Navy SEAL team dispatched to the Pesh district of Kunar province that was ambushed. Luttrell was the sole survivor with broken back and numerous shrapnel wounds. He evaded the Taliban by taking sanctuary in a local village. Under the code of hospitality, Nelmastia, the Pushtun villagers protected him, eventually sending an emissary to the nearest U.S. base to secure his safe uh, departure. How Pushtunwali is enforced is by NARC. NARC uh, may be translated uh, as price. It's tribal, tribal customary law and refers to centuries-old body of unwritten rules and regulations based on precedent for dispute resolution. It covers penalties and punishments of all kinds of offenses against native customs, norms, and traditions. NARC is tribal law ban binding on all members. Those refusing to obey NARC are refused tribal membership and rights, which means they are left unprotected. The most important point of tribal membership, again, is individual survival. While it gives you a place, a status, an identity, a history, it also provides you protection. Protection from whether it's individual robbers, whether it's an aggressive governor. Um, without that, you are vulnerable to a whole sorts uh, array of um, possible difficulties. Uh, so it, it is a very important uh, um, entitlement. If you are NARC, you are entitled, uh, tribal membership, you are entitled to the protection based on honoring the NARC. Uh, there is a Pushtun proverb uh, that gets to the point of what happens when you're Pushtun, you're away from the, the village. You still have those tribal obligations, you still have the tribal identity, you still have that tribal protection. So the Pushtun tribal uh, proverb is, you may leave your homeland, but you cannot leave the homeland of NARC. Uh, this proverb explains the fact that Pushtuns give the utmost importance to NARC. Tribe of NARC is judicial system serving the spiritual, military, uh, material needs of the tribes. Uh, there are two main uh, systems of NARC. And just, oh, oh sorry. Uh, the two main uh, systems of NARC are the Amazai NARC and the Razmak NARC. They not only govern judicial life of the people of these tribes, but other tribes, <coughs> pardon me, but other tribes, Pushtun tribes, refer to their rulings, refer to their codes of NARC for settlement in, in their disputes. Now, it's interesting. The Amazai NARC extend from Ghazni to Ningrahar in eastern Afghanistan, including uh, provinces of Pakti and Logar. That's the homeland of the Gilzai. The Razmak Nark is enforced across the border in Pakistan's northwest frontier province, Pushtun lands in Waziristan and its surrounding areas. Again, Gilzai. They are the ones that are the preservers uh, of the Nark and the ones that are uh, their system used by other Pushtuns. Now, the characteristics of um, the Afghan culture, uh, of an Afghan family, I should say, are that it's endogamous. It is parallel cross-cousin marriages are preferred, usually first cousins. Its patriarchal authority is vested in the uh, male elders. It's patrilineal, inheritance genealogy passes through the male line, with that exception that I referred to earlier, um, that the uh, Pushtuns are flexible, are pragmatic, and in conditions, both uh, female line and adoption, p uh, tribes will be considered legitimate Pushtuns, even if they don't follow this uh, particular characteristic. Patrilocal, 
when the bride marries the groom, she moves to the groom's family and severs her tie with her family. She's not considered part of that family. She's now part of the groom's family. Uh, polygyny is polygamy. Multiple wives are permitted, but it is not uh, practiced uh, very much. Now, the features of the Afghan family. The first is that the ex Afghan family is the, uh, the extended family. And this is the major economic and social unit of Afghan society. They contain three to four generations, including the male head of the family and his wives, his brothers and their wives and children, his sons, their families, his cousins and their families, as well as all unmarried and widowed females. Now the nuclear family are commonly geographically grouped within the extended family. And they, nuclear family, includes ex elderly grandparents and single or widowed aunts. Uh, the extended family is usually epitomized by some type of residential unity. They reside together in either a valley, a village, or a single compound. So this is a kala, a residence of an extended family. As you can see, it's a fortress-like appearance, uh, protection, uh, extensive uh, size for uh, many people. But the courtyard, once again, depending upon the internal size, they could have a, mo uh, a mosque there. They could have stables. Uh, they could have a, a small uh, uh, citrus uh, grow. Now this is the layout uh, close to the mountains uh, of a uh, Afghan village. The first one that we saw was just a uh, street level view, more or less. This is from top down and you can see the layout uh, rectangular uh, for protection. Now Within um, Afghan culture, there are specific rites of passage, birth to death. At birth, the Shahada, the profession of faith, there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet, is whispered into the baby's right ear. A piece of sugar or a piece of date is placed in the newborn's mouth so that the first taste of life is sweet. Baby boys are circumcised within a week of birth. A baby's head is shaved on the seventh day to symbolize service to Allah. The family weighs the hair and then, if they're able, financially, they donate an equal amount of gold or silver to charity. On that seventh day, the name is given to the child and a feast, Akika, is held to give thanks. Children begin reading the Quran at an early age, and uh, recitals by children of the Quran uh, can begin as early as the age of four. Marriage, as we mentioned just previously, is a social and economic relationship. Parents commonly arrange the marriage. The marriage bride and groom are most always from the same tribe, often first cousins. Now there's a reason for this, uh, a practical reason. One is financial and the other is honor. A financial, if you marry within the same tribe, the tribe hasn't lost any wealth. And if you marry someone from the tribe, there's no question about the honor of, of, of the woman. Someone outside, there could be aspersions cast. You know the honor and the virtue of the woman. So those are two important factors uh, for uh, marrying within the tribe and marrying first cousins. The prospective bride and groom are in their teens. There are exceptions, of course, where the groom is much older. Now, there is this reciprocity between bride and groom. Uh, the groom gives a bride price. At the same time, the bride gives a dowry, a, a mutual exchange, at least symbolically, if not in complete value. The marriage ceremony uh, is a contract between both sides. And after the signing of the contract, uh, there is a reading from the Quran to seal the marriage ceremony. And that is followed by festivities called walima, which can last up to three days. At death, once again, 
the Shahada, the profession of faith, is whispered in the dying Muslim's right ear. After death, the body is washed, rubbed with perfume and spices, wrapped in a white cloth, no casket, and buried without a casket facing Mecca um, within 24 hours. Now, the, um, these rites of passages are not simply limited to Afghans. Many Muslims around the world uh, practice much of these, if not all, especially the birth and the death. The importance of entering the world and having the Shahada um, whispered into the ear and the first uh, taste of light being sweet by sugar or date or something uh, that is sweet and can give the hope of life. And then, of course, at death, the washing, uh, the facing of Mecca in the 24 hours. But these are the rites of passages uh, that uh, are practiced by uh, Afghans. And it's not just Pushtuns. Uh, all the others will practice it. The Tajiks, the Turkmen, the Uzbeks, the Hazaras, uh, the Baluch, the Nurasani. In conclusion, tribe and culture have been shaped by the geography of Afghanistan. It has made them self-reliant, independent, egalitarian. They, in turn, have molded the country of Af Afghanistan. They have ensured uh, a confederation of ethnic groups that coexist. When tribes are respected by outsiders, both the foreign governments and the government in Kabul, and this was most prevalent from 1930 to 1978, uh, the reign of the king, uh, Zahir Shah, Afghanistan successfully functioned as such a loose coalition of ethnic groups. It was characterized by they lived on their own lands according to their own traditions. However, when an attempt is made to impose political and cultural centralization, as was done first by the communists and then by the Taliban, on such a tribal society, a political instability ensues. And we're seeing, hopefully, uh, the last phases of that currently as uh, some order can be reestablished after the US uh, leaves with the political, uh, political uh, system established and functioning. So that is it, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for your time, and I look forward to um, look forward to your uh, questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fallon. I appreciate that. Uh, and as our guests are entering their questions, while they're doing that, that uh, for and remember that this is not my area of depth. So, uh, in relation to the the infrastructure in Afghanistan. Uh, thinking back to how you know, all roads lead to Rome, and that the kind of connective role that the infrastructure plays. How do you see the the, the roads and the the other types of networks, physical networks in Afghanistan, either helping or hindering the transfer and the movement of cultures? Okay, let me, if I can, uh, go back to the one map that can show you some of the infrastructure. Um, there's, as long as the, uh, the, the uh, ethnic groups feel that they are respected and they're not being imposed upon, uh, here, this is, the fir uh, this is the major artery going around uh, the, um, the Central Highland. For efficiency, there was, there was a plan to actually try to pierce this uh, more direct route, but it's just uh, too dangerous as well as too, too costly. Um, there is a road being built by China uh, in the Northeast going through the Joaquin Corridor. This was considered most impractical or almost impossible, but their uh, plans on doing it. They had acquired uh, one of the world's largest, uh, I believe it's copper mines. So they're going to export, uh, uh, exploit the mine and uh, ship it out uh, and want to have access into China directly. The problem, potential problem, 
is it also gives China uh, military access. Any road that can be used as converse can often be used uh, for military purposes as well. That's what happened with Uzbekistan uh, over the Friendship Bridge, the Soviets built uh, into Afghanistan. Uh, that road was great to uh, facilitate um, the economy, the local economy. Uh, Afghanistan was noted for its uh, uh, even though it had limited arable land for uh, its fine citrus products, including uh, pomegranates, grapes. Um, um, but that road was the road used by the Soviet invasion in 1979, uh, part of the invasion, the other being air. Um, the topography, the geography limits what you can do with the roads, and um, I think if the roads are just maintained in the country for the near future, uh, can be just restored to what it was before the, uh, as it functions, as the groups trust one another, as it was before the, uh, the communist coup of 78. Um, the first thing is to, to establish some, uh, some type of political resolution, which apparently from what I'm reading requires um, uh, bringing in the Taliban um, I'm trying to think of the name of the professor. It, it eludes me right now. Uh, he's a sociologist who has studied uh, the area and said that there's so many groups that are saying they're Taliban. Uh, some don't even recognize Mo Omar as their leader. Uh, it is just a name uh, to indicate rebellion. That if, uh, if there was an election and they participated, there would not be one Taliban bloc. They would be falling apart. Um, according to uh, tribal and personal differences. Um, so right about now, the, the transportation system, it could be restored to what it was uh, before the Soviet invasion and take that as the starting point, that would be ideal. Okay, great. And, and again, I encourage all of our audience to enter their questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Mr. Brown, given that both geographically and culturally, there seems to be a, a no way to get around this idea that the people of Afghanistan operate as a bunch of little islands, uh, that there's this predilection to being enclaves that are only loosely connected and only operate together for trade or for a given activity. Do, do you see that there is any sort of commonality that can be elevated so that well, for lack of a better phrase, that does can Afghanistan actually function as a country? Well, it has functioned as a country um, most of the time. Um, it it depends on on what we mean by that. Too often, in my opinion, we have a Western concept uh, where there is the overriding importance to the state and to the central government. <coughs> pardon me, ensuring its control over all regions. And control by that, I mean uh, that they establish rules and regulations across the board, whether it's education, whether it's transportation, what have you. Um, and in a tribal society, in my opinion, that's not going to work. It's like apples and oranges. You have an industrialized, highly educated society, and then trying to take that model and put it onto a tribal society, uh, the tribal society worked. And I feel that you should first, one should first look at how it worked, why it worked, and then try to ensure that after these 30 odd years of on again, off again, wars, invasions, occupations, warlords, uh, that it could be reestablished and allowed to function and have an organic growth uh, if there are going to be changes, the thing that I thought was was a possibility uh, was uh, the king, Zah uh, Zahir Shah. Uh, when the Taliban first arose, one of their first objectives, they claimed, was restoring the king. And the importance of the king was he was also a modernizer. His wife jettisoned the burqa, which was scandalous at the time, which is going back to the 19... 30s, 40s. Uh, he was a Pashtun, so he had connections to the Pashtuns. He had a good relationship, or at least a working relationship, with the non-Pashtuns. He was 
well respected and got along with most of the religious leaders. So he was bent on a Western system. His model uh, was Great Britain, and he wanted to make the country more um, where the king would reign but not rule. Uh, that didn't work out simply because other family members, his cousin who was the prime minister, overthrew him. But if he was brought back, having that uh, having that record of working both with the secular and the sectarian, with the modernizer and with the tribal, would have allowed, in my humble opinion, that the country could have had organic growth. It could have achieved more than uh, being locked in time uh, in the in the 19th century. But if you try to push a society uh, your way, first one has to find out is, is, when I say your way, I mean our way, the Western way, is that the best way first? Second, is that the best way for this area? There, there is always this danger of hubris with a more powerful society thinking that it knows what's best, but it doesn't have the history, it doesn't have the culture, and it doesn't have the geography, which is so important on how this country, how this culture is going to uh, grow. And yes, it, it functions on a tribal level, and it may continue to do that, uh, even with uh, some modernization going on. All we have to do is take a look at the rest of the Middle East, look at uh, uh, Libya. It's breaking down into tribal militias. Um, we have the restoration in Egypt of the military rule. But where the Arab Spring came, what we saw is one of, not in all, but in some, uh, loyalty reverted right back to the tribe. So this is a concept that's very powerful in tribal societies by their very, dare, uh, by their very definition. So I think uh, for the future, if we can get uh, a stabilized uh, Afghanistan, um, where we end both the warlords and, and the Taliban fighting, uh, and we can reestablish uh, the pre-78 conditions, um, that's the first thing. And yes, it's going to be a series of islands scattered uh, as, as, as a circle around that uh, central highland. I think an option to see if that could have been advanced and more quote unquote modernized uh, concepts introduced. For me, as of now, I think that was lost when uh, King Zahir Shah was not re reinstored. He had, he had the connection uh, both of those that looked to the past for guidance and those that were seeking something in the future for guidance. Now, I don't know who could replace him with that authority. And I think what we have to do is just hope that it functioned for 200 years pretty well. Uh, it does have crises in Kabul, but the outlying regions do function as those islands, um, and that's where it could, uh, where you're going to have to uh, base the future on those islands to to accept them for what they are. Okay, and kind of to dovetail off that, there's probably just one more question. The it seems very much like uh, trying to have a thing called Afghanistan is very much like herding cats. Uh, and the the king kind of modeled his thought with that tentative balance of reaching to the past and reaching to the future. He modeled himself after the UK or the or Great Britain time, and it seems very much kind of based on on uh, Britain's expeditions into Africa and how well that turned out. Is Afghanistan sort of doomed to continuing? Uh, repeated attempts to make it a nation, despite the the constant pulling apart of sort of the the south and the west to Iran and, and then the the east northeast to off to Pakistan, uh, are they constantly doomed to just a, a rotating effort to try and unite what probably just can't be united? What do you think about? That? Well, I think that um, they are weak in their um, surrounding countries. And Iran uh, will seek uh, to have influence uh, in Herat, in the, uh, in the eastern, which at one point was part of Persia, and in the center region uh, with the Hazars, who are Shia. There's a bit of a strain with uh, the Tajiks uh, because they're Sunni. Um, so there will be that pull. 
and Afghanistan will be used by both Pakistan and India uh, in their own geopolitics. Um, the one interesting thing is at this point I do not think any country uh, sees its interest being advanced by the breakup of Afghanistan. Um, will it be weak? Yes. Uh, it's just the nature. It is surrounded by uh, significantly powerful uh, countries. I don't think it will uh, be partitioned or break apart, but it's the idea of state is something that is is different for them than than for us. Uh, the central government is just some authority that they recognize as to represent them internationally uh, and to have certain rights and duties, but limited. They're not to violate the cultures uh, or the norms. Now, war brings out the most extreme elements of these. Uh, once we see the Taliban saying uh, no education for women or no women able to go out without a male escort, even if they're wearing the full burqa, um, some of these will be uh, tempered uh, after after the passions of the war have ended. But I don't think that Afghanistan will ever be the state, uh, a, a state as the West defines. It will be uh, Switzerland. It won't be France or Germany. Uh, Switzerland can function fine. Afghanistan has, has a different history, but geography, the, uh, the relationship, the balancing act, if you will, with the ethnic groups is sufficient because they're based on a respect that I'm in this area and you respect me. Now there are problems. I know that uh, during the war and after the war there was attempt of uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, especially in the north of ex uh, expelling Pashtuns that had come in there because they were thought that they were sympathetic or spies for, for the Taliban. But uh, I don't think Afghanistan will break apart. I don't think Afghanistan uh, will ever become a state in the western meaning of the word. I think its history is so strong uh, it differs from Af Africa because there are very few countries in Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Black Africa right now, with the exception of uh, Ethiopia, uh, that had a long history within a region, with a name, uh, with more or less uh, the same borders, comparable borders. Um, the other ones, even though they have also uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, like Nigeria, it wasn't a working together. The British took one area and took another colony and put them together. No one asked them. This was a working relationship with the Afghans. The Tajiks, the Pushtuns, the Hazars, um, it was more agreed upon and I think that's why it will survive and will not have that difficulty. When the difficulty comes, it will be either two. Uh, a power play for control in Kabul and uh, after that an attempt, if it is done, it would be the third time and it would be a mistake to have Kabul try to homogenize the culture, modernize the culture uh, of, um, of the country, of the different ethnic groups uh, by fiat. It has to be organic and it will be weak and it will be played upon uh, by, by other countries. Well, but it will survive. The, uh, and, and one last bit, and I had asked this of a lot of our guests, is, what is your one big thought pertaining to uh, how the impact of geography on the culture of Afghanistan? We'll wrap with that. Could you repeat that again? What exactly? The Sorry. impact of... Uh... Right, the, the impact of Afghanistan geography on the culture of this thing we call Afghanistan. The, uh, the importance, in my opinion, is that the culture uh, developed within the Afghans uh, a sense of the importance of tribe and the importance of identity to the tribe uh, and ensured that there was a sense of egalitarianism, that there was social cohesion within the tribe, and most importantly that there was a sense of, uh, uh, there was group consensus on key uh, decision making. So unlike the, the neighboring, there was a, a quote, democratic with a small d, um, a spirit uh, with, within, the, uh, within the tribes based on the geography required a group, uh, members of a group to help themselves because uh, it is so poor um, in, a, in agricultural land. Now the one thing that did come up, the geography, 
is that um, recently uh, a special aerial photography revealed a great deal of mineral deposits, uh, supposedly over a trillion dollars. And there is going to be the rush to exploit these. That is going to have some impact on culture. The movement of, uh, of companies or countries back into the area is going to have some impact. But it's primarily going to be in the east. And it's the Gilzai, I would think, that are going to uh, be the ones that are going to have to respond, uh, whether they stay firm with their culture or if they make changes. But the thing about the culture, Bushtunwali and NARC, it's more like uh, common law. It evolves. There's precedence. If it doesn't fit an existing situation, say 1880 or 1920 or even 1970, there will be an analogy found. So it's a living culture and it has means to adapt. And it does. That's why there's no full list of the code of Bushtunwali. Uh, they tried it, I believe it was in India in the, uh, in the 17th or 18th century, and they gave up because just, they just found more and more. It is, it is a remarkable code um, for survival. It ensures egalitarianism, in my opinion, uh, and, and group survival. The only thing that's going to come now is um, the impact because this road that the Chinese are building through the Wakan Corridor for the um, copper mine, uh, there are also rare earth metals that have been discovered in, um, in Afghanistan. So there's going to be a lot of movement into the country. China has 97% of the market on rare earth metals. She's the number one, um, she's the number one reserve. Afghanistan was discovered to have the world's sixth largest. She's an alternative source. So the culture is going to be impacted uh, upon what's going to come next, which is going to be the rivalries between state corporations or private corporations of different countries uh, for the resources. But I think that uh, the Pushing Wally has shown that it can uh, adapt.